da 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 to themselves in 2000 or lead up to 2000 which was how do you make the boat go faster or will it make the boat go faster love the concept and uh, I've certainly used it as a bit of focus point for myself over the years ever since I heard about it can't remember who I listened to tell the story out of the British 8 when they talked about that but it became a fundamental question that they asked themselves will it make the boat go faster uh, recently had a paddle with a guy called Josh Dunkley Smith new kid uh, on the scene, I suppose, in Australian rowing, doing very, very well. Uh, stroke the four, the World Cup in uh, in uh, this year, in Poland, Poznan, I think it was. Um, stroke of the eight as well. Obviously, there's a lot of young, talented guys coming through, and there's some good guys around who have been in the system for a while, and there's some returning athletes like myself, Duncan Free, and a few others. Um, but yeah, I had a paddle with Josh, and something stood out for me. And it's that thing around understanding what will make the boat go faster. And I find myself regularly debating or disputing with coaches as to the view of what will make a boat go faster, sometimes disputing it with athletes. And you know what, I'm really sick of the lack of understanding as to how you create one boat speed and then how you sustain boat speed. So let me get on my high horse and let's shatter a few myths. Uh, once your blade is out of the water, you have the capacity to maintain speed, if not anything, increase boat speed if you do it really well. Now, there's a cost to that. Give you an idea. Say you put the blade in the water, you drive it through really well, and if we're all equal, we drive through the same speed. We produce the same amount of force, we move the boat the same distance, we exit the blade out of the water, we're all as good as each other taking the blade out of the, out of the release, out of the finish. You have one crew, spins the hands away, pops the knees up, rocks over really quickly and gets set onto the feet and then slows down. You have another crew that allows their hands to sort of flow around the back appropriately, I suppose, without forcing the hands away. Stretch off the back, soft knee break, and then once they've broken the knees, they gradually allow the seats, wheels on the seat, to gradually increase rolling speed into the front. Stop it there. If both crews did the same thing, you would have a different effect on boat speed. First crew I mentioned, the effect that they would have once they've released the blades out of the water is an increase in boat speed as soon as the body break, rocks over and as soon as the knees pop up quickly. You'd have an increase in boat speed right there. Not as high of an increase in speed as the drive, but still pretty substantial. But there's a cost. You increase boat speed there, you now have the weight on your feet, you now have the body set over, you now have the stern of the boat sitting down in the water, and you are now slowing down while you are contributing to the boat speed stopping. And then you're expected to put the blade in the water. Again, equal applying force as all other crews and get it going again. I believe that's the stupid way to do it in rowing. Can be done though. Crew two has also exited the water. A little bit more tempered with the hand speed away. A little bit more careful with the body going over certainly much softer knee break. As a result, potentially looks lazy, looks to be taking their time. Boat speed doesn't spike once they break their knees. Boat speed maintains. The boat has also been sitting in an optimal plane for longer. And then as they increase the roll into the front, they don't rush the slide, but they do subtly increase the roll into the front. By the time they get to the front, they've got less weight on their feet, less stern down, less wetted surface area. They have a greater increase of speed right before the catch. So they've actually had a speed increase just prior to the blade going in the water. And if they're really good, they can actually pick it up 
feeling lighter. So, just in one stroke, crew one looks better because they look more dynamic. Same speed through the water, but they're more aggressive getting over, and as a result, the boat looks like it wants to take off. Problem is, every time they get out to the front and have to pick the boat up, it, it's getting heavier and heavier and heavier, and it's only a matter of time before they pay a price for that. Crew two doesn't look any more athletic or dynamic. In fact, almost looks a little bit slow, a little bit tempered in some way. And remember again, they've produced the same force, the same boat speed out of the stroke in the water. And on that very first stroke, and that very first recovery, they're gonna look like almost as if, almost as if they haven't been as lively and as athletic. But give it 10 strokes, give it 20 strokes, give it 30 strokes, crew two, I guarantee you, will start to get boat speed on crew one. Because every time they pick the boat up, the boat speed is actually higher by the time they stick their blade in the water than crew one. Now I've watched for years coaches and athletes do this whole hand speed away, you know, force the hands away, force the body rock over, force the knee break, and then slow down. For fear of not being set out front. For fear of not being capable of rowing a front turn without having everything over in place and in complete control. And it's bullshit. So we know from biomechanics and we know from GPS data and we know from speed data per stroke that by listening to the boat, by being more subtle with the boat, by being careful about the boat, by keeping it in an optimal plane, by also making sure that you optimize the speed at the most appropriate time, which is just prior to going back in the water. Effectively, you have less load on the handle out front. And if you're producing the same force, after a while, you're able to maintain that speed. It may not look as fancy, it may not look as polished in terms of hands away and rocking over, but I guarantee to you, crew two, from 500 meters through to 1,000 meters through 1,500 meters will gradually start to move away and people will marvel at it and go, wow, how are they doing that? They look so easy. Their boat feels lighter at the front turn than anyone else's when they do it that way. Now, when you row small boats, you have to learn how to pick the boat speed up. You have to learn how to not kick it out front, in effect. But you can kick it out front if you've allowed your boat to accelerate into the front turn versus accelerating off the back turn and slowing down to the front turn. So I've watched this in rowing for years. I remember watching lightweight rowing and thinking to myself, you know, they seem to be so patient around the back and then they almost zip forward and catch it on the run and it looked easy and that to me looks more athletic and dynamic because they're really backing themselves in from all the way from the finish right the way through. They're backing themselves in with a sequence off the back to say that they will set it up appropriately and they'll set the pacing of the recovery up appropriately so they actually get the best boat speed out of it. Generally, lightweights can't do it any other way. If they do, they get crucified because they're just not strong enough. But a heavyweight rower and often a heavyweight coach will have the notion that our boys are so strong or our girls are so strong, you know, we'll get them to drive more acceleration and, and get them on their feet and you know, have it slowing down. Unfortunately, it just doesn't work that way. And I think when you're really dynamic and you're flying along, you've got to have the capacity to have less check on the boat. And you've got to have a greater speed on the boat, carrying greater speed on the boat as you're coming into the front turn. So, it's something I've been thinking about a bit recently, and I've watched a lot of crews. And when I paddled with Josh Dunkley-Smith the other week, I, I noticed that he was very much doing what all good heavyweights are being taught to do, which is get the hands away, get up and over, you know, get that all sorted, and then pace it into the front. Problem is it slows down to the front, and as a result, it gets hard for people to pick the front turn, but it also gets hard to row really good length um, in terms of elastic length. And then the other part is you've got to have a really good engine and be super strong to keep that going all the way down the track. And I think that becomes problematic. So for me, when you're 84, 85 kilos and you're not as strong, you've got to find better ways of doing it. And I certainly look towards lightweights in that regard as, as a key example. The Australian Lightweight 4 for years I thought was fascinating in terms of how they would focus on 
setting up the rhythm off the back, almost looking lazy at the back, and then letting it flow and catch it on the run. The Danes, interestingly enough, when you watch them in 2004, and they're flying along at 40 strokes a minute, they're actually zipping into the front turn. You know, the hands are the hands are going away because of the speed of the boat. There's no doubt about that. But they're actually extending all the way to the front, and they're actually increasing slide speed into the front turn and picking it off at 40 strokes a minute. And as a result, you watch them through the 1,500 metres as the crews are getting back on them, and you can almost sort of, sort of see how easy they're doing it, and then they can push away again. So physiologically, they're probably superior. You know, when you hear about Eskil Eberson and all that sort of stuff in terms of what he's able to do, and when we say superior, we're talking superior by like half a percent. We're not talking superior by like 5% or 6%. So if he's half a percent superior, but they're also looking after their boat speed, not because they're rowing with what's, what looks easy, but because of they're still creating good boat speed by being efficient, they gain a percent that way and all of a sudden you've got Olympic title after Olympic title for crews like that. So for me, I, I look towards the lightweights. I think they're a fascinating example of, of how to look after the boat, how to listen to the boat, how to feel for the boat. I very rarely look at heavyweights and think to myself that's inspirational for whatever reason. But I did watch the American 8 in 2004 and really enjoyed what Brian Volpenheim and all those guys were doing in that particular crew and marvelled in particular at one, they look strong through the water, but how they look like they were looking after the boat on the recovery. And if you compare that to American crews through 2000 and 96 and all that sort of stuff, what a complete contrast. So the athletes there had all of a sudden, through Mike Tatey and the athletes and maybe the way they were thinking about it, had all of a sudden started to really understand that they could produce 500 metres and 1,000 metres of raw speed as good as anyone in the world. They'd been able to do that for years. But getting the rhythm right meant that all of a sudden they were producing that raw speed and they could actually row away from the field and stay away from the field, which is pretty, pretty amazing. I also believe watching the Canadians in the eights in 2008 in Beijing, and obviously they'd been through the whole experience of winning lots of world championships as well, but watching them in that particular year, and all of a sudden the front turn, in many respects, looked like they were carrying much better speed through the front turn than all the other crews. And although they looked dynamic around the back, and although they looked like they were really doing a lot of work, I thought the knee break, funnily enough, was still pretty patient. And as a result, the rest of the flow from the, uh, from the knee break onwards into the front turn was pretty consistent with that sort of slide speed idea that I've been mentioning just then. I also look at sort of things like sculling and you know, it's a fascinating thing to watch guys like Mahe Drysdale and you know, Olaf Tufty and all that sort of stuff. And then you even go right the way back to Purdy Carpin and Peter Michael Colby and stuff like that. And you just watch some of those crews and you go, they've got the raw physical capacity, but what they're often doing when they're racing is they're not killing boat speed. They're not forcing the issue off the back and then slowing down. And I think that's a really important thing to understand as coaches and as athletes. So for me, it's my pet hate. I really get frustrated when I get told I've got to spin and get my hands over and get my body over and get set early and all that sort of stuff. I'm always happy to try and do it. But deep down inside, I fundamentally don't think or don't feel like it's conducive to producing the best boat speed at race pace. So going back to the 2000 question that the Poms had for themselves, will it make the boat go faster? I think if that question was asked more regularly, and if that question was measured more regularly and understood better, we'd start to see a different look of many, many crews that potentially scratch their heads sometimes and wonder why they don't get certain results. For me, it's about coming back to that question about exploring that question and about being disciplined enough to gather your own data, your own evidence on making sure that if you believe it makes the boat go faster and you believe that it makes the boat go faster at 36, 37 strokes a minute and you believe it's maintainable, then you've got a recipe for success. And I'm pretty much sure that most crews that have found the answer to that have usually gone and had success that they've wanted to have or got consistent results over a long period of time at World Championships and Olympic Games. So, for me, the dry phase is the dry phase. We always work as hard as we possibly can. How we meter out the force is obviously, you know, there's subtleties there. But the recovery phase is what makes the difference between first places and six places in a field. Between crews that continue to get good results and crews that somehow struggle after one or two seasons. Anyway, there's my two bobs worth. I'd like to see people looking after the boat speed more. 
that's what I'm going to be focusing on going forward in the future. Until next time, enjoy.